Hello and welcome. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes here. If anybody has joined us, feel free to type your burning questions in the chat off to the right. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with the April 2015 Land Steward Refresher Training here at the Monadnock Conservancy. My name is Emily Haig and I'm the Stewardship Director here and I will be guiding us through this hour-long presentation. As I said before, feel free to type your questions in chat and I'll be sure to answer them as we get through the presentation. I've got about 30 slides to share with you today and uh, these are all refreshers really. This, none of this should be new information, although we will be going over some changes to the monitoring report that are new this year, as well as some data that we gathered from you and from our landowners last year. So hopefully this will be helpful to you and we'll be recording this and posting it later. So uh, if you aren't able to answer your questions now, um, you can always catch us after the fact. Okay, well, welcome to Google Hangouts. So what brought you back? Why do you monitor? We heard from a lot of our land stewards last year that most people do this really because they enjoy hiking the land. They have a connection to the conservation cause and to the Monadnock Conservancy. And really they feel it's the best way that they can give to the organization, which we certainly appreciate. Um, but if you have any special reasons why you are coming back this year, feel free to get them in chat. We would love to hear from you. And of course, we want to know what you're hoping to learn. Um, for those of you that are returning, what are you stumbling on? What, are, what could you use some improvement on? What are new technologies maybe that you want to take advantage of? We'll try to cover that. I'd like to start off by um, having a quick overview of our monitoring season. Now that the snow has melted, uh, you can get out and monitor anytime. And our deadline is the same as it has been for the last two years, October 31st. The reason that we have this deadline is so that it allows a little bit of extra time for staff to go out and do makeup visits if something comes up and you're not able to complete your assignments. What we don't want to have is um, a situation where most of the monitoring visits haven't been done yet and it's December and there really isn't much time in the calendar year to do those visits. And we do operate on the calendar year because we report our monitoring visits on our Form 990 to the IRS. So um, it's important that we do that in a timely basis so that we can meet our charitable trust obligations and also so that we can uh, continue to be an accredited land trust. So last year, for example, 30% of the monitoring visits scheduled happened after the deadline. So that was a little bit of a cliffhanger and uh, staff ended up making up 25% or about a quarter of that third of the visits, um, which ended up being about a dozen. So there is quite a bit of last minute shuffling that needs to happen. That's why we like to leave a little extra time. If you're having a trouble hearing me, just type in the chat. Um, we don't have this on audio via a conference call, so um, you need to let me know if you can't hear. Thank you. 
All right, moving right along, I just wanted to share this one slide that outlines the monitoring process. One thing that's new this year is that we did release a monitoring handbook, which will be posted to the website after April 30th. And uh, that gets into a lot more depth about the monitoring process. But this is a really basic outline. And you should all be familiar with this by now, but just I'll go through it briefly. Um, pick up the field notebooks. We can leave them for you um, anytime between 9 and 5 on business days. And then go ahead and contact the landowner. Give it a good three tries. And then if you don't get a response, go ahead and do the visit. Um, and then next, uh, before you actually do the visit, you'll want to review the field file and set up your monitoring priorities, figure out where you would like to go on the property. Then, of course, conduct the visit and then write the report and compile the attachments. Now, one thing that's important to reference here is that it's really helpful to do this as soon as possible after the visit, not only while your memory is fresh, but also so you create a good solid legal record. Um, we have some new information about what's admissible in a court of law in the state of New Hampshire. And records like this really need to be completed as close as possible to the time of the actual visit in order to be considered uh, a regular business practice. So it's important to do it right away. Uh, and then if you find something that you're concerned about, let me know right away so that I can follow up on it, of course. And last but not least, resign, return the signed report and the field notebooks and any of the attachments that you've put together. And like I said, there will be more information on the volunteer page of our website starting on April 30th, which is next week. So moving right along, I just wanted to share a few thoughts from our leadership team here at the Monadnock Conservancy. Um, your role is really important as a volunteer, and we really want to take a minute and acknowledge this. We could not uphold our commitment to stewardship and our accredited status without the work of our volunteers, and we are really grateful for that support. We also recognize that the work our volunteers do uh, through monitoring helps us build and maintain the connection that we seek in our strategic plan. And this connection is multifaceted. First, obviously, there's the connection between you, our volunteers, and the land as you watch it change over time. There's also a connection between you and the conservancy as your relationship with the organization deepens over time. There's the connection between you and each landowner that you visit with as you both gain perspective on the land. And then there's the connection between you and the public who we serve because we know you're sharing your insights and your experiences with family and friends and community members as you talk about this work that you do. So uh, we really hope that you find these connections rewarding and encourage you to give us feedback at any time about how we could improve your experience as a volunteer. So you can either email me or our executive director, Ryan Owens, ryan at monadnockconservancy.org, um, with any feedback that you'd like to give us. So with that, I'm going to step down from the big picture and get into the weeds a little bit. Um, I'm going to walk us through the monitoring report and the monitoring process. And what I'm going to do is touch on um, different portions of the monitoring report that are different this year and then give some examples of how best to complete those sections of the monitoring report. So starting off just a quick reminder of what you're going to want to look at in the field notebook before you plan your visit and set up um, your, your meeting with the landowner and get ready to go. Obviously, you want to look at the maps, and we will be updating the monitoring maps this year, creating a master database of all of the uh, sort of points of interest that we have been gathering over the years, such as recreational features, areas where there have been previous violations, um, areas of interesting natural features or scenic viewpoints or anything like that. So our hope is over time to have all of these things in a searchable database that also pinpoints them on the maps that you all use when you structure your visits. If you are GPS savvy and you would like to gather data points for us when you're on your visits, please feel free to do that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation. You can send data to me in uh, KML or KMZ format, which are both Google Earth formats or uh, in regular GPX format as well. So the monitoring map shown here is an example of what we will be creating for all of our properties over time. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit small. You can zoom in on your screen if you'd like to see more detail. 
So once you've reviewed the field notebook, the next step is to set your priorities of where you'd like to go on your visit. Obviously, you want to walk boundaries wherever possible, any heavy use areas, any new activity or new structures on the property, and hopefully you'd be seeing correspondence about new structures and activities in the field notebook to trigger, trigger that for you. Definitely walk the exclusion area boundaries and definitely visit any important natural resources that are cited in the conservation easement deed. One thing I'll share with you is that our most common source of violations is uh, encroachments from third parties and abutters. So that's why it's really important to walk both the boundaries and the access points and the exclusion area boundaries, because that's where most of our problems arise. The photos on this slide show um, points of interest from visits that happened last year in 2014. And you can see there's a recreational feature on the left. There's some dumping in the center there. On the top right, we have a land steward pointing out some natural erosion that was happening on a recreational trail where water bypassed an existing culvert and just washed out the trail. So that's definitely a feature that would be monitored this year as well. And finally, on the lower right, we have um, what we call a barway here in New Hampshire, where um, a stone wall has been punctured uh, for access by a vehicle or by hikers or something like that. So that's an access point that should be checked for new activity. So once you've gone ahead and planned your visit, the next step is to contact the landowner. and. In the survey last year, uh, we asked what was challenging for people, and many people indicated that actually contacting the landowner was pretty challenging for them. So I thought I'd throw in a few pointers about how to make this part easier. Um, first off, up at the top, I've included a sample script of what you might want to say when you make that cold call to a new landowner. Um, sometimes it's helpful to email them first and start the introduction that way because it's a little less intimidating. Um, and then you can follow up with a phone call. Another thing that can be helpful is to use the annual landowner survey as a conversation piece. And those surveys went out in March of this year and should be in the field notebooks by the time you come pick them up. I've received about 40% back from landowners. So um, that's another good place to start. Finally, another uh, conversation piece that you might want to try is starting off with a compliment to that landowner about something you enjoy on their property or something that you've noticed uh, that they've improved or something like that. That's often a good place to start. So once you've started the conversation, um, make a note of how you contacted the landowner in your monitoring report and then also mention whether they accompanied you on the monitoring visit and what you talked about. Um, it's sometimes things will come up in the monitoring visit that the landowner forgot to indicate in their survey. So it's another opportunity for us to get information about management questions that they might have or um, interpretation questions that you can pass on to staff, anything like that. So there's a new place in the monitoring report here in question five for you to make note of what you talked about and whether there's any outstanding questions. Okay, so once you've contacted the landowner, it's time to pack the field bag and get ready to do the visit. So I wanted to mention once again that any of the maps in the field notebook are available for you to use during your visits. So that goes for clean copies of the survey, uh, copies of the survey up front in the notebook, any of the maps that are topo or aerial maps, anything like that. Whatever is in there, you are welcome to mark up. And if something is missing, definitely let me know, and I'll make sure that I replenish that. Everything pictured here in this slide is also equipment that's available for you to borrow from our office. And um, just need to let me know ahead of time, because we do have limited supply. But um, we're happy to be able to let you take advantage of these things. Some other things that land stewards have suggested bringing, obviously, are water, your cell phone so that you have a way of communicating, um, rain gear just in case. And if you're comfortable and you feel like you need to improve boundary markings, you might want to bring along some signs and nails um, to add to the boundary if you're absolutely confident of where it is. And that's another thing that we can provide you with. Last but not least, uh, we have these land steward permits available for you to take from the office, or I can send them to you by email. And this is something you might want to just stick in the dashboard of your car when you park. Um, every once in a while, people get questioned or um, 
property owners get phone calls about you know cars that are left by the side of the road or something so sometimes it's a j just a nice courtesy to um, identify yourself and what you're doing okay so you have contacted the landowner you've planned your visit you've packed up your field gear and you're ready to do the visit um, while you're doing the visit, I think I would recommend taking some field notes about where you're going in case it's a really big property or a really long day and you might forget you know, certain areas that you've touched on. You're going to need to describe in relative detail where you went on the property in question six of the monitoring report. And I've got some sample text up here to give you a sense of the depth that we're really looking for here more than a couple of sentences. It's also great to attach a map showing the route that you walked so that you have a picture and words. Um, and between the two, we can get a really clear sense of exactly where you went and what you were likely to see. This is a hand-drawn map, which is totally acceptable. If you prefer to use GPS, you can do that. If you need help using GPS, let me know and I can talk you through some of the uh, different um, mobile apps or GPS devices that we have available for you to borrow. But analog is totally fine. Just a hand-drawn map definitely gets the point across. After you've described your route, it's important to touch on any areas of concern that you observed during your visit. And this is a question that we changed this year. We added some prompts here so that uh, you'd get a sense of the most common things that we typically see on our properties, and it might help refresh your memory of what you observed. Here in the, in the photos pictured, um, we have some littering on the right, and then on the left-hand side, we actually have some tree cutting that happened to be on an adjacent property but was very close to the property boundaries. So the land stewards took a photo of it in this case just to show the extent and the possible impact on the conservation property. Another thing to note about the photograph on the left is that it was taken using an app called Theodolite, which is available for iPhone and Android. And this app is really fantastic. It's basically, um, it's named after the surveying device, a theodolite, which gathers a lot of elevational altitude and location data. And it basically stamps all of that information onto your photograph. So um, if you zoom in on that photograph, you'll see that it's got a latitude and longitude printed right on it. It's got the date and time stamp. It's got altitude, elevation, and the azimuth and angle where the photograph was taken. So that gives you a lot of really specific information that's helpful to pinpoint the exact location of the photo and the contents of the photo. That being said, the photo on the right-hand side is also completely acceptable, and it's what I would call the old analog method, where a uh, land steward just snapped a photo on film and then printed it out and signed it and dated it and attached it to the report. Totally acceptable. This question also has some room for narrative, so feel free to fill in the notes section with any details that you want to add about what you observed, whether it's something that is in the list above or it's other. Um, a great, this is a great place to put that description. Okay. The next question is about land uses, and this is really a chance for you to just summarize what you observed on the property. We've put the most common land uses in this list here, and um, you can see in the example given that the land was forested and it had some recreational uses on it. And again, it's really helpful to have a narrative description accompanied by some photos here. So in this case, we have a description of the forest types and then a description of the hiking trails on the property and the condition of those hiking trails, along with a couple of photographs that show the typical structures um, on those trails. This is about the level of detail that's really helpful. You don't have to write sentences is really good. All right, moving along. The next question is about man-made changes. And this is a really important question because most of our violations obviously result from man-made changes. So again, we've added a list here to prompt with um, the most common types of alterations that we see on our conservation properties to help um, make it easy for you to just check off whatever you're observing and then add a few notes. 
So in this case, we had some field clearing and some road alteration. And again, there's a narrative description and some photographs to accompany it. On the left hand side you can see the field clearing and um, there's a stone wall and a utility pole for scale. In the center there's some grading and some stumps and some dumping. And then on the right hand side you see some road alteration with another land steward for scale. I keep emphasizing uh, objects for scale. It's really important to incorporate that into your photos if you can. This, I would say this is on the light side for narrative. Usually it's better to have a, a more thorough description, especially for extensive alterations like those pictured here, but it does get the point across. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in chat. I'm not seeing any activity in there, but um, I am keeping an eye on it, so I'm happy to stop and answer questions. All right, the next question involves describing natural changes, and sometimes these are directly related to man-made changes. You know, if you have excavation going on on an adjacent property, a lot of times that can trigger erosion or flooding on uh, in a different area. So reference that if you can, and try to tie, tie your descriptions together if you think that's necessary. We've added another list of prompts here to um, sort of prompt you on the most common types of alterations that we're seeing. And then again, just add some notes and maybe a photo. In this example, we're looking at a class six road, which is um, open to the public, but doesn't allow vehicle passage. An old road that is experiencing some heavy, heavy erosion. And in this case, the road is really valued as a recreational resource, so and as access to the property, actually. So um, it's important to show this change because it's really affecting the ability um, for people to access this property. Okay, so once you've um, described all of your observations thoroughly in the report and you've included all of your photographs, uh, it's important to indicate what you're attaching to the report. If you haven't embedded your photographs right into the report, if you're, if you're not doing the report in Word or in PDF form, then this is the chance to attach them and make sure that they're signed and dated. Um, you can also attach any sketch maps that you make. We have sketches on here separate from maps because, for example, if you observed a structure or uh, a new trail or a new road, sometimes it's, um, it's helpful to just draw a quick sketch uh, with some measurements on it, indicating the scope and the scale of that structure or improvement um, so that there's a clearer sense of, of what's really going on. We've had people draw farm stands or trail kiosks or animal feed structures or things like that that show up. Um, a photo is also sufficient, but if you really want to get technical and draw something to scale, that's helpful. Also indicate if you're attaching maps. In this case, we had um, a land steward that created a map using his GPS unit. Um, he offloaded his track and he happened to have access to a National Geographic mapping program called Topo and he printed out this map and attached it to the report and it includes the date stamp and the name of the property um, so it's definitely an authentic record you can like i said before you can attach a hand-drawn map also or a copy of the survey with your route marked on it that's completely fine and then last but not least make sure that you sign and date the report Times are changing. It's possible to sign things digitally. If you would like to learn more about how to do that, definitely get in touch with me. I've shown a, a couple of examples here where you can um, either sign using an app on a phone or a mobile device, like a tablet or an iPad, um, or you can, if you have a copy of professional level um, Adobe programs, you can create an authentic digital signature associated with your software license. And that's what uh, Steve Brackett did here. Either of these methods are fine. And uh, as long as it's an authentic signature, that's all we need. If you do sign something digitally, we'll just ask that we hold a copy of your original ink signature on file. And for many of you, we'll have past reports, so that won't be an issue. We can compare that. 
And just a moment on the legal side, the reason that we're so emphatic about signing and dating reports is that if we ever had to enforce an easement by uh, litigating in a court of law here in New Hampshire, it would be really important to show that the monitoring reports were authentic records that were created at the time that they claimed to be created, and that it was our regular practice to have all of our staff and our volunteers signing and dating their observations in this way to make sure that they're authentic. So it all comes down to legality, unfortunately. <laughs> It's uh, New Hampshire Rule 803, parentheses 6, for those of you that are really interested in getting into the nitty gritty and probably putting yourselves to sleep. Okay, moving on to some more interesting topics. I wanted to share with you some tips for this year that we've come up with um, based on feedback that we got last year and questions that people asked, and also things that we think are important for you to know. First, I, I can't stress enough that New Hampshire is now number one in the nation for Lyme disease occurrences, so it's really important for you to be safe and cautious about uh, preventing tick bites. It's honestly the biggest risk in monitoring. And June and July are the peak times to be really, really aware. That's when the nymphs are feeding. That's what this life cycle is showing here. Ticks have a, a two-year life cycle, but um, the nymphs develop into adults in June and July and early August, and that's when they're the most hungry. So they're feeding on animals and humans, and they're most likely to transmit infection. So take precautions, wear long pants, tuck in your clothing, wear repellent, and definitely do a tick check and take a shower every time you come home from a monitoring visit. Honestly, almost every environmental professional I know has had Lyme disease, so um, it, I know for a fact that it's really high risk. and um, please take it seriously. There are also other tick-borne diseases, unfortunately, that we're exposed to. So if you think that you have any symptoms at all, just please monitor them carefully and uh, get checked out because it may not be Lyme disease, it may be something else. But it's important for you to just get tested as soon as possible if you think that you're having a problem. Uh, there's a lot of great information on the website that I've pictured here. If you have questions about what the various symptoms are or best methods for prevention or best methods for treatment and on and on. So um, feel free to check that out. Another thing I wanted to share with you are this year's hunting season dates. I know a lot of folks don't like to go out in hunting season if they can help it. So here's some dates to keep in mind. Um, next weekend is youth turkey hunting weekend. So it might be a busy time out in the woods depending on your properties and whether they allow hunting. Um, keep these dates in mind. The biggest dates to keep in mind are deer season and um, deer archery starts on September 15th and then I think muzzleloader typically starts or sorry firearms typically starts on November 1st or in that ballpark. So hopefully you should be done with your monitoring by then and it won't be an issue but um, just in case it's important to keep these things in mind. We also have bright colored vests available for people to borrow if you're interested. All right, now we're going to get technical for a minute. Um, for the last couple of years, we've been trying to make more sort of mobile technology available for monitoring, and we're not really up to speed on this yet, but we do have a couple of options. Um, we developed a PDF form, so if you have Adobe on your mobile device, um, I can send you the file and you can type right into it and submit it. You can even sign it if you have that particular app. This slide is showing the form fields in the monitoring report form that you can use on an iPad. And I've had a couple of people field test this, so I know that it, it works for the most part. <laughs> um, we will be field testing as staff iPod, or sorry, iPad uh, forms and also um, mapping software that will integrate the monitoring report directly into it. So hopefully after this year, we will have that, have all the bugs worked out on that and be able to lend that out to volunteers so that you can gather GPS data and photos and write the report all in one fell swoop and then email it or upload it to the office by wireless or by phone uh, LG network and be done. So that's the direction we're headed, and many land trusts have already gotten that far, but we're not quite there yet. At any rate, if you have questions about how to try iPad reporting, 
feel free to call me or email me and I'll send you the form and I'll walk you through what we know already. Another thing you might want to try this year is using GPS on a mobile device, either uh, an Android or an iPhone or um, another smartphone. There are a lot of apps out there now. One that I would strongly recommend is Gaia GPS, and this is also recommended by the Nature Conservancy. It's a very reliable program that has really strong accuracy and really easy, user-friendly interface. It has the ability to take GPS data and also take georeferenced photographs and integrate those data and associate them so that you can email yourself your GPS data and your photographs uh, basically at the end of your visit. The screenshots here show you what the program looks like and you can see on the bottom right it shows you the lat long, how far you've walked, your elevation if you want to see that, and you can use different base maps as well. You can use an aerial photograph or a topo map or uh, what's sort of called a, a cycling map, which has a lot of cultural features added to it. These apps, or this app in particular, is only about $20. And we've field tested it against our GPS units. And the accuracy is equal to those of the handheld Garmin units, even with an external receiver. So they're really reliable, really accurate. Definitely recommend using them. If you don't like Gaia, there are other apps out there and I can recommend a couple to you, but I think this is probably the, the most user-friendly and reliable for the money that you're gonna find out there. Okay, so those are the tips that we have for you this year. I wanted to move into sharing with you some results from the surveys that we took last year to inform both um, how we communicate with you as our volunteers, but also what we've been hearing from the conservation easement landowners. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes to go through some survey responses, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions for anybody that's um, watching this live. So many of you have asked how many of our conservation easement landowners are still the original grantors versus how many are secondary landowners and whether that pace is changing now that uh, the real estate market has changed a lot in the last few years and you know people are getting older, especially in this region. So we took a look at this and I looked at all uh, 218 of our conservation properties and then looked at how many of them have changed hands and if they've changed, changed hands, whether they've stayed in the family or whether they've just been sold on the open market. So right now, as of April 2015, um, we have about 198 conservation easement landowners. About 160 of them are the original landowners and then we have 25 or so that are just buyers. They are non-related persons that purchase the property. And then we have about 13 properties that have changed hands, but they've stayed in the family, whether it's um, to a successive generation or it's in a trust or anything like that. So a little less than a quarter of our properties have changed hands in the last, well, 25 years. We have seen an interest increase in the pace. However, I would say we used to have maybe one or two properties a year that would change hands and now we're up to probably four or five. So it's a little hard to measure this because the number of properties that we have is going up every year, um, but the rate of change is also going up. So it's a proportional rate. Oh, excuse me a minute. I need to postpone a restart. Good old windows. Okay, so next I wanted to share with you a little bit of information from um, the landowner surveys that we sent out this year. Um, every year we send out a survey to all of the conservation easement landowners asking them what activities have changed on their properties and whether they plan to do anything different in the coming year. You've all seen these, I'm sure. And so far, like I said, we only have about a 40% response rate. But of those responses, the most common things that we've been seeing are that most landowners are interested in improving wildlife habitat. So if this comes up on your monitoring visits, one thing you might want to mention is that 
the county extension services are available for free for landowners for consul consultations with either a forestry specialist or an agricultural specialist. And in Cheshire County, our county forester is Steve Roberge, and our county agricultural specialist is Carl Majewski. And their offices are right in Keene, and they will go and um, take the time to walk a property with a landowner and give them advice and information about um, how they might want to meet their management goals. So it's really something that most landowners don't know about and they should take advantage of. And you might want to mention it if this comes up. I should also mention that the Farm Bill finally passed last year. Many of you know this. So the Farm Bill program guidelines are being revamped, but there is Farm Bill funding out there. So it's possible for landowners to get cost share funding to do management activities on their properties. And that really makes a difference for a lot of people. Most people might not be willing to pay the money to do some openings for rabbit habitat or for grouse or for um, songbirds or what have you. But um, if they can cost share it, it makes it possible. So it's worth mentioning. Also, we found that most landowners allow some forms of public access. Very few landowners post their entire property or discourage uh, one form of access over another. One thing that we did find was pretty common is that most of them post around the house, which makes a lot of sense. They don't want to have hunting in their areas of activity. But these are things that we would love for you to check when you're out there monitoring the properties so that we know what properties are posted and what ones aren't because we do get inquiries from the public about whether they can hike on different properties. So um, if you don't mind, make sure you answer that question in the monitoring report. And finally, um, it looked like what most people are planning on doing this year are road and trail upgrades and maybe some non-commercial forestry, things like view clearings or um, trail clearings or maybe some firewood harvesting, that kind of thing. Moving into the survey that we sent to all of you last year, I just wanted to share a few of the results here. Many of you asked how that data would be used when we sent the survey out. So um, I wanted to let you know that we do use it and I've used it to inform uh, the program offerings that we have this year. For example, um, we asked how you preferred to be contacted, and at least 63% of you said that you prefer email. Some people indicated that they like email and phone. Nobody said that they like phone only, and nobody said that they liked snail mail. So I'm going to continue to send monthly emails with sort of a, a newsletter digest format um, to keep in touch with you. and let you know about upcoming events or um, equipment that we might have for you, that kind of thing. We also asked you what type of training you prefer and here's how it broke down. Um, more than half of the volunteers asked indicated that they prefer the in-person workshop format and we did have about 13 people at our in-person workshop last week so um, hopefully that was helpful. And then the next highest category was webinar, which is why we're here today. About 17% indicated that they prefer webinar. Um, some people said that they don't think they need training, and that's about 25%. I think a lot of folks have done this enough that they don't feel like they need it. And then about 13% said they prefer one-on-one -on -one training or refresher training. And we're always happy to do that. Um, that's part of the reason that staff go out with volunteers once every five years is to give the opportunity for that one-on-one -on -one date and also to mark boundaries and, and you know, look at any problem areas and that kind of thing. So most importantly, we asked what would improve your volunteer experience. And these were the most common answers. Um, many people indicated that they would like to get more sound bites and updates um, on monitoring and enforcement, but also just on, in general, what the Conservancy is doing. So um, one thing that you may have noticed is that we've started adding all of the volunteers to our e-newsletter list. So you should be receiving monthly or bi-monthly e-newsletters from us, as well as the emails that I send out that have some updates on monitoring season and tips and all that sort of thing. Many people also indicated that they wanted more opportunities to meet other stewards. So I think we'll continue to do the end of season celebration that we've been doing every year. We'll try something new this year. Feel free to send me suggestions on that. 
Um, but we'll also try to pair you up with a partner if that's something that you're interested in doing and if you would like to meet other stewards that way. Some people indicated that they'd like to change assignments after a few years. That's always an option. If you would like to do that and you haven't yet, just shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, one person said they would like to find a violation, which I thought was fun. Um, I guess that their properties have been getting pretty boring, so they wanted to find something exciting. Um, many people said they would like to monitor with staff, and again, that's why we're trying to do every property every five years. Some folks want to try out mobile reporting, great, and some people still want to work on their compass skills, and all of those things um, are possible, especially with the one-on-one. -on -one. So with that, um, that's all I had to share with you today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in chat. Um, otherwise, I hope that you're thinking about monitoring and ready to get some visits on your calendar. One other thing I will mention before I sign off is that we are online. And if you haven't checked out the Monadnock Conservancy on Facebook and on YouTube, that's another way to keep in touch with us. We do have some videos on YouTube. We have about 12. And there's a lot of um, sort of interviews with our landowners and uh, some slideshows and some talks from our annual celebrations. So that's another way to learn more about the organization. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we are having a photo contest this year. So we really want your photos. Last year, I sent out a link to an album that we put up on Shutterfly of all the photos that people took on monitoring visits. We'll do that again this year, but we want to see your favorite places on your properties. And in the fall, when everybody has had a chance to do their visits, um, we'll put together an album and we'll allow everybody to vote on their favorite three. And then we'll give out some gift certificates to Monadnock Imaging based on the winners. So please keep your camera with you on your visits this year and take some photos of your favorite places to share with us. All right, that is pretty much it. Does anybody have any questions? If so, you can type them in chat. I'll put my email in chat so that you know how to contact me. Thank you for watching, those of you that were with us today, and I will be saving this and recording it and posting it later if you didn't get a chance to see the whole thing. Thanks again, and happy monitoring.